Greetings all, and welcome to Lucas Brews. In today's video, we're going to have an inbox review of the old Hasegawa 172nd scale Mitsubishi G4M. Bearing in mind, this is quite an old tool, but let's see if it still holds up, and if uh, perhaps we are in need of a new Betty tooling in 172nd scale. So the G4M1 is pretty much the uh, poster child for Japanese World War II bombers. It was the main aircraft the Japanese Navy used from 1940 all the way until the end of the war. Uh, and it's pretty famous for being amongst the other aircraft, the G3M, uh, sinking the two battleships from the British, which were the first capital ships to be sunk by air power alone um, that were defending themselves. And uh, it would be used all the way until the end of the war to carry the infamous Oka uh, suicide bombs. So it's a pretty important aircraft, even though only about 2,400 were made, um, which means it wasn't obviously as produced as many other bombers at the time. Um, it was very important for them, and uh, pretty much it's seen action in every single Pacific battle. And uh, this kit in particular is obviously the uh, G4M1 Type 1 attack bomber, which is its usual designation. Betty was the allied nickname for reporting uh, these aircraft, and uh, Model 11 was the first production model of the aircraft. There were many variations during the production run, and to be honest, I'm not an expert on this aircraft, so I wouldn't probably be able to comment very well on what uh, particular production time period this uh, kit is based on. Um, but basically, the Model 11 was the first one fitted with the 14-cylinder uh, Kasai radial engines. After the war, the Japanese aircraft were painted white and given green crosses to uh, signify that they were um, not going to attack anyone. So that's what this kit is focused on. This is basically um, aircraft that survived to the end of the war and were given these sort of surrender markings. And as you can see on the box, we've got uh, one of them in the scheme and it's flying through some clouds. So not really in any action, obviously, because the war's over by this time. So uh, that's pretty much the box uh, out of the way because there's nothing except for the titles on the sides, nothing on the back. So we'll open it up and have a look at the instructions and then we'll have a look at the plastic parts. So the instructions are in a uh, fold-out kind of format which is not my favourite because obviously it takes up a lot of space and um, I prefer having a book, but oh well. Um, so on the front here we've just got the box art and we've got in both Japanese and English a description of uh, the history of the G4M1 uh, Talking a bit about the uh, request for Mitsubishi to develop a replacement for the G3 um, And talking a bit about the prototypes and uh, Yeah, what became basically the model 11 and then it's just got some of the um, data on the crew So it's got a crew of seven uh, length of about yeah got all of that sort of stuff there uh, plus armament which is cool uh, opening up here, we've got a sprue map, and as you can see, there is not a lot to this kit. Uh, and there's kind of a reason for this, and that is because this tooling is from 1969, according to Scalemates. Um, which means it's really quite an old kit. Um, so yeah, it's, it's going to be quite basic. So you've got a sprue there with the, uh, the fuselage, looks like a piece of the cockpit, fairings for uh, the landing gear area. An instrument panel, uh, tail wheel, a few other little accessories along here. Then we've got a sprue for the wings. We've got a clear sprue here with all the clear parts. And uh, looks like all of the engine bits are on this sprue um, over here. Uh, we've got a painting guide here, and it looks to be in Humbrol. Um, so with the H um, colours, but some of them there is no equivalent for, like the dark green, the cockpit colour, tyre black, interestingly, and... Um, Propeller colour, whatever propeller colour is, uh, I'm assuming it's that sort of brown colour that you see on some Japanese aircraft, but um, yeah, so there's no Humbrol equivalent, so it's just got the name of the colour, which is, yeah, it's going to be a bit annoying, it's going to be very hard to figure that out. I mean, uh, luckily it's the, um, the Japanese colours, so as long as you have um, some set of colours, for Japanese colours I like to use the Vallejo stuff, um, then you should be alright finding a, a Mitsubishi dark green and a cockpit colour. Um, as for propeller colour, like I said, assume it's sort of that red-brown. Um, so step one is, uh, interestingly, assembling the landing gear. So, oh, you've also got a key up here, by the way, for um, what each step entails. But anyways, uh, for this, you start off with assembling the uh, landing gear by putting the two tyres together and sticking it into the struts there. Uh, then you've got the cockpit, which um, has a couple of seats, and you've actually got crew figures, which is pretty cool. You don't get that in a lot of um, more modern kits, and um, I don't really talk about it enough, but I really do like having um, pilots. Um, although I don't tend to do videos where I paint the pilot and put him in the cockpit, that's because I usually do that off-camera 
um, and do it at a later date just so I've got the video done. But if you guys want to see me do more cockpit, um, more pilots, uh, be sure to let me know. But anyway, so you've got a crew of three in the cockpit section here, and it's got a bit of an interesting layout. You've got two uh, pilots, and then a, I'm assuming he's a navigator of some sort, just sitting behind them. Um, but anyway, so you've got a very basic kind of cockpit floor section, the joystick, the seats, and the crew. Uh, then you've got the two fuselage halves. You stick them in between before gluing them together. You've got all these little windows to put into place. Um, a few more complex windows at the back here. And you've also got uh, the rear machine gun, which I believe was a um, 50 cal kind of equivalent. So about 12 millimeters. But I could be wrong. I know the um, armament varied a lot on the, um, the G4M1. So depending on which uh, aircraft it is. The next step here is the fairings for the landing gear. So you've got two halves that you join together plus an upper section at the front. Um, and you put the landing gear in between the two halves. Then you've got the engines here. So they're just a basic single piece for all of the cylinders. And they're obviously not doing the, um, the second row of them because there would have been two rows. Uh, but I can understand why they did this because the um, nacelle for this engine is really quite narrow at the front. So the, um, the air intake is pretty small so you won't be able to see a lot of detail. That and also the propeller has quite a large spinner. So yeah, you're not going to really see that second row. So fair enough, I can understand why they've done it that way. But anyways, you install the, um, the cylinder details. Then you have a propeller with a spinner on the front there and a little washer that you glue to the propeller. Then you've got uh, the landing gear doors going on the fairing there and then you attach the engine to the front there. Looks like there's a bit of keying to make sure you put them in the uh, correct position there. I don't think there's any keying for the engine but we'll have a look at that later. Wing assembly which is pretty simple. There's just two parts that you stick together similar to the fuselage then you attach that to the fuselage. Elevators at the back there are a single piece and uh, then we've got the front uh, instrument panel which goes in in the cockpit there. Then we've got the engine installation which has a lot of exclamation marks saying be careful. I don't know why, I, it looks like a pretty simple step but anyways, uh, be careful when doing this. Um, God knows what could happen if you screw it up. But anyways, you've got a tail wheel at the back there as well as the, uh, the two engines. Uh, once you've done that, you've got the canopy installation, which is pretty normal. You've got the um, the glazing at the front for the bombardier and a special window for aiming. Uh, looks like a little pedo tube, a few exhausts, various antennas on the roof there for um, radio and navigation stuff. Then you've got the cockpit, which is pretty long for a, um, a bomber. Like it's, It stretches quite far back, obviously, because it's got the third guy there, but there's a bit of extra space. Then we've got a massive blister at the back here. I don't know if there would have been a machine gun sticking out on some aircraft or if it's just like an astrodome kind of thing. But uh, there's another big dome behind the, uh, the front dome. Then we've got more blisters on the side there. Those would have also been uh, defensive positions, but it looks like they're all sealed up on this particular version, which I suppose makes sense seeing as this is a surrendering aircraft. Uh, then you've got a rear one for the, um, the tail gunner there. Um, and I think that's, yeah, that's pretty much it for uh, assembly. At the back here, you've then got uh, the two markings. Both of these are surrender um, and envoy transport aircraft. So you've got number one and number two, both from August of 1945. Um, to be honest, I can't really see a difference. They would have been painted pretty much all over white. Um, but yeah, I don't think I see any decals for any um, serial numbers or that kind of thing. So... Uh, oh, here we go. The only difference is the door shape by the looks of things, because I think you had an optional door. Yeah, somewhere back here. Yep. So, fill recess, uh, for example, too. So, yeah, there we go. You've got two markings in this kit, and the only difference between them is one has a circular door and the other has a more oval, bigger door. Um, otherwise, they're pretty basic, just white with the green crosses. That's the instructions out of the way. Let's have a look at the plastic. So we have two sets of um, sprues or bags for each sprue. We've got the clear parts in one here, uh, and then we've got the uh, the main kind of sprues here, which are molded in white. So if you really didn't want to paint, you could probably just um, very carefully glue this together and not uh, paint it if you were doing the uh, surrender schemes. So I'll start off with the fuselage sprues, and um, well, that's uh, there's only two points holding them in, so they're very very um, likely to fall off. Uh, sod it, might as well just pull it off. Straight away you can see it's showing its age because you've got uh, raised details for all the panel lines and the riveting. I don't mind having uh, raised rivets on stuff like this because I think a lot of the um, the Betty Bombers would not have been um, flushed or the rivets wouldn't have been flushed because it's a slower aircraft. Um, but I think I do prefer panel lines to be recessed. And I think it's a bit weird when details like the Bombay are recessed but the panel lines are not. 
but it was just um, for the time, I guess. It is 1969 that this kit was made, after all. Um, but yeah, fuselage looks like it's roughly the uh, the correct shape. Uh, I believe the Japanese had a nickname for it, which was the um, cigar leaf, because it looked a bit like a rolled cigarette, because it's sort of fat in the middle and then it tapers at both ends. As for inside, um, there is absolutely no, no detail whatsoever. Um, other than a few bulkheads which are moulded into the um, the aircraft there and a little bit of a floor. But otherwise, uh, no interior panel lining or details of any sort. You're going to have to add that yourself, which is something I will probably be doing. Uh, and the fabric on the control surface is a couple of small lines, all of them raised. So pretty basic, um, but at least it looks roughly like a G4M1, so that's a good start. Um, other details include the instrument panel there, which is all raised details, but at least they've actually put some in there. Um, I believe you've got a decal for these as well, so that's pretty nice. A very basic little tail wheel there. Here we've got the um, the struts for the landing gear, and as you can see, they've done a pretty basic job of it. They've moulded the, um, the frames there as raised detail, rather than trying to have hollow parts there, if that makes any sense. Um, but you probably won't see too much of that anyways, but oh well, it's a little bit more basic. Um, here we've got the top part of the landing gear fairings with a little bit of a hole there for the exhausts. Again, like the fuselage, it's all raised details. There's a few little rivets and some uh, raised panel lines there. Uh, here we've got uh, one set of landing gear fairings. Again, same thing. Lots of raised details for the rivets and the panel lines. Um, no interior detailing for the landing gear um, fairings there, unfortunately. Elevators, same, uh, raised rivets all along there, and um, similar to the rudder on the fuselage as raised lines for the um, fabric on the control surfaces, and recessed lines only for the elevator and the little uh, trim tab there. Um, same on the other side here. And uh, here we've got the fuselage floor, which is pretty basic. Um, as you can tell by the only um, cockpit parts we've seen, it's gonna be a very basic interior. Um, in fact, it's probably gonna look something like a War Thunder cockpit placeholder in terms of how basic it is. Um, but yeah, you've just got the floor, no detailing on the floor, just some holes for the seats to fit into and looks like a little step to get into the, uh, the no section of the aircraft. So yeah, pretty basic there. Continuing with the wings, it's the same story as the rest of the aircraft. There is a bunch of raised uh, rivet lines and uh, raised panel lines as well, and uh, very basic fabric texturing, but recess details for um, the elevators and the flaps there and the trim tab. Oh, um, there's also a bit of uh, recess detail for the center kind of um, panel here where the wings join. Uh, it's a bit tricky to see, but it's, yeah, that line there is recessed. So it's a bit weird that they've done a mix of them, but I think, like I've said, that's just how the kit was at the time. Uh, this line here is also uh, recessed, which is a little bit weird. Um, but yeah, all the wing halves are pretty similar. You've got the top ones here, bottom ones here. The kind of only difference is the bottom ones have a section here cut out for the landing gear. Uh, and you've also got some very basic bulges there for the um, the control joints, which are pretty, pretty basic. But um, again, it's of its time. And already we are at the final sprue. So this is really basic for a large sized bomber or a medium bomber, I should say. I'm starting off with the engine cowlings. They're pretty basic. Um, they've done, looks like, raised details for the um, the access hatches or panels on the um, the engine cowling there. They've molded the cow flaps um, to the uh, cowling, which I'm not a big fan of because they've done it in the open position. Uh, which means if the aircraft's on the ground or taking off or in slow flight, yeah, that's that's accurate. But for cruising, they'd probably have them closed up a bit. Um, and there's no detail to see inside the cowling. So, and because the engine's only a simple piece like that, you won't see any exhaust detail. Um, so it'd probably be better to have it closed up. Maybe you can always um, take them off and then reposition them or replace them with a bit of card because they are really quite thick as well for um, cow flaps. Um, so yeah, pretty basic cowling, but that's kind of to be expected. There we've got the propeller blades. Um, I probably should point out everything's got a little bit of flash on it. Um, the propeller blades, you can kind of see a little bit more, but it's not terrible. I've seen much, much worse flashing. Um, there are a few bits here that are worse, like the other propeller blade there, and there's a few chunks in it that are a bit flashy. Uh, and the landing gear here as well is quite flashed. Um, but otherwise, yeah, it's, there's a bit of flash to remove on this kit, but that's kind of to be expected. Uh, here we've got the landing gear doors. They've got raised uh, rivet detailing on them, and um, they've done raised um, interior ribbing, so that's nice that they've at least done a little bit for that. Um, there are, though, some very annoying ejector pin marks in um, 
visible spots there, but I think they probably couldn't have helped that, really. Um, then we've got the engines, which are um, a mix of raised details for things like the ignition wiring and uh, the cylinders, but there's recessed details on the cylinder heads. Um, so yeah, it's pretty basic, but at least there's something there, like as a bit of a placeholder for the engine, so that's, that's good. Spinner, pretty basic part, nothing really to complain about, other than the fact that my other spinner has gone missing. Um, it was back in the plastic bag there, but you can imagine the uh, spinner there would look just like the spinner here because it's the same part number. A few smaller parts here for things like the radio antennas, navigation equipment, that sort of thing. Um, then we've got the back of the propeller spinners, so you glue that part to there to hold it in place. Uh, here we've got the exhausts, which are pretty basic parts. You might want to replace them with something else. Uh, here we've got the rear-facing machine gun, and it's, um, it looks massive. I'm wondering if it's like a 20mm or something. I know it varied on the um, the G4M, as I've said, so yeah, it could be a 20mm or something like that. Uh, control yokes, which are very, very basic there. And uh, down in this corner, we've got uh, three pilots, and they're done quite nicely, actually. You can see they're very clearly wearing the, um, the Japanese aviators uniform. Uh, they've got some nice detail on their faces there, and even though their hands are pretty basic, in fact, it kind of looks like they're... Um, they're missing part of their arms there, and yeah, there's a few imperfections on them, and they're missing their feet, um, or at least they're very badly moulded feet, because um, it doesn't look like they've actually got any toes or that coming out. Um, otherwise, they look quite nice, and yeah, they're very distinctly Japanese, which is quite nice. You don't get many um, figures that are precisely done to be Japanese. I know with all the airfix kits, the pilots are pretty basic, kind of the same, but these guys look pretty nicely, um, nicely done and specific. A um, bit annoying, they're all looking in the same direction. You might want to reposition their heads. I was about to say cut them off, but that's a little bit brutal. Um, yeah, reposition their heads and have them facing a bit of a different direction so they're not all staring to the left, um, as if the left engine's on fire or something. But yeah, nice though that they've included three figures. Would be cool if they had the rest of the crew, but oh well, you can't have everything. And like I've said, it's a pretty old tool, so it's to be expected that there's flash, there's raised details, and what is here is a little bit basic. So all of the clear sprues come in this bag here, and um, yeah, as you can see, they're not honestly looking too bad at all. Um, they're a bit thick, and um, there are a few little tiny scratches in some areas, um, but for the whole, for 1969, that's not bad. They may have um, redone the tool for this in recent years, seeing as they've reissued it so many times, but... Yeah, honestly, I was expecting a lot worse, and um, yeah, if I put my finger to it, even some of the more curved parts aren't really distorting too much. Um, so yeah, you can see quite clearly into the um, the cockpit there. Um, same with the um, tail section there, really nicely done there, and um, the nose section is a little bit more distorted because it's a bit more rounded, but yeah, honestly, I'm quite impressed. Blisters look really good as well. They've done, looks like they've done a very thin raised kind of, panel line for the um, the frames for the canopy, which is very, very shallow, so that's going to be very tricky to paint um, if you're doing it the way I do it, which is to do acrylic paint and then scratch the excess off. Um, but yeah, I suppose masking would also be a bit of a nightmare because you can't really clearly see the, um, the frames if you masked it up. So yeah, a bit of an annoying plane to do with all the transparencies, but that's pretty typical for a World War II bomber. Um, yeah, and other parts look all right. There's a few scratches and distortions on the um, the bomb panel there, as you can kind of very, very vaguely see. But um, yeah, no, on the whole, clear parts are really quite good. And finally, we've got our decals, which are nicely, um, whoop, nicely sealed in a little clear bag here. Actually, they're not sealed at all. They're just sort of slid in there. But anyways, um, so yeah, Hasegawa decals I find aren't too bad. Um, these ones have got a bit of a weird film on them that sort of looks all patchy and yeah, I don't know if these decals are going to be very good. I'm probably not going to be using many of these decals anyways, but yeah, you've got a fair few um, of these green crosses. Um, they might be different sizes for each aircraft, otherwise you've got um, doubles just in case for some reason you want to do two of these aircraft um, in the uh, surrender scheme. Then you've got a decal for the door, which is a bit interesting. Um, I think we better have a look at the door, actually, on that note. Yeah, so um, the door on this kit is just a um, recessed circle, and it's not like they've even tried to do any panel lines, which is a bit annoying. So, yeah, you're going to have to fill that up, and there's going to be no rivet details, which is going to look weird. Um, and then if you want it to be the, um, the more oval door, then you have to yeah fill it in and then slap that decal over the top. 
So yeah, very, very basic for the door there. The decal is literally the panel line for the door, which is funny. Um, then we've got instrument detail, which is, yeah, not too bad. I mean, they've done a little bit of it, so yeah. Uh, then we've got the sort of serial marking and details for the aircraft, which are the same for both of them. Uh, then there's just the markings for the propellers, so no one gets their head chopped off by accident because they couldn't see it. Um, so yeah, decals don't look too good, um, and that's a bit of a shame because they're probably the newest, um, as you can see, 2015. So it is a bit of an older kit, but yeah, would have expected a little bit better from Hasegawa, but oh well. So obviously, after having a look at this kit, it's pretty clear that it is definitely showing its age. Um, I think it's nice that Hasegawa keep reissuing it because there's not really any other tooling in 72nd scale of the G4 M1. Um, but having said that, it would be really nice if we saw a more detailed one come into this scale. I know to me it do a very brilliant 48 scale one and you can get lots of aftermarket parts, so it would be cool if we got one in 72nd. To be honest, I'm a little surprised that no one else that I know of has um, come out with one in 72nd that's a bit more modern and detailed, um, especially since it was such an important aircraft and it, it's pretty iconic, I think, with its strange tail shape and the, um, the long cockpit and Japanese engines there. But oh well, maybe one day. Um, I will be probably spending quite a lot of time uh, building this one and actually doing up a uh, 3D printed interior, or at least that is the, uh, the plan that I've got for it. So it's going to be quite a long time before a build video on this comes out, but um, yeah, I, I want to do a, um, a good job on this aircraft because it's a little bit tricky to get one. And um, yeah, my main reason for getting this was I wanted to expand my um, Pacific War collection. Uh, and I also was wanting to get one of these for the um, the big animation I've got planned about Milne Bay coming up. Um, they did play a pretty small role in that battle. Um, they sort of ended up uh, doing a couple of bombing raids on the airstrips that the, um, the Aussies had um, before then having to get sent to Guadalcanal because the Americans were landing there. So they didn't play a massive role there, but... They've been around for pretty much the entire of the Pacific War, so a very important aircraft. Thank you very much for watching this video. I do hope you enjoyed it and got something out of it. If you did, please be sure to leave a like and also subscribe to the channel. And if you really want to help things out, please join my Patreon page. The link is in the description. And you'll see currently on the screen the names of my current patrons who help keep the channel going. So thank you very much, guys. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, feel free to leave it down in the comment section below. But until next video... Take care, and as always, model on.